Hi, everyone. Um, from uh, mid-cap UK equities, I'm going to ask you to jump into um, a world that's unconstrained by um, geography, unconstrained, unconstrained by sectors, um, and by market cap, so thematic equities, which are global um, by definition. There's been uh, a lot of ink spilled over the past couple of years, um, and more and more so. In fact, when I started a decade ago, I couldn't remember um, having seen that much interest, especially coming in from institutional investors, um, which previously didn't really know very well where to put um, thematics and fit thematics within their overall allocation. Um, and what I'd like to demonstrate to you today, apart from telling you a little bit what our philosophy is behind thematic investing and how we perceive um, its place, is to take away that this is actually an alternative to a global equity exposure and not something purely niche. Um, and I, I love this quote by Wayne Gretzky, a good hockey player plays where the puck is, a great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. And essentially, this is the idea. Um, unconstrained, unbenchmarked, trying to find future winners, not past performers. And at PICTE, we have three layers of focus. We define um, thematic investing and our approach um, through three layers. And the first thing is we find themes at the intersection of megatrends. And I'll go into megatrends later because we've actually touched upon several today. Uh, we talked about cities. Typically, urbanization is one of these very big, very strong megatrends, um, given that most of us will be living in cities um, over the coming years. And this idea that actually specialization and knowing everything about a little bit is the key to proper stock selection um, for an active manager. A typical global equity manager um, that has a benchmark, uh, as well as a benchmark view, will have to know a little bit about everything. What we try to do is to know everything about it a little bit by focusing in on themes. This is the second pillar, purity. We want to ensure that when our investors give us um, their, their money, that we're actually investing in the theme. So if we say we're investing in water, we want to be invested in highly pure companies that are dealing only with water um, related, star, uh, related activities. And finally, this means that actually our investment managers are essentially analysts and portfolio managers. We don't have a separate team of analysts picking or giving us a list of companies. The analysts and the portfolio management function is the same. And we take a very long-term view. We talked about structural growth earlier, and this is really something that um, is at the key of, at the at the, um, the key to our philosophy. So I don't know if you're familiar with this man here on the right. Have you ever seen him? You should. He's a UK citizen. This is Fadja Singh. Um, and this is actually a really good example of a very strong megatrend, right? Demographic development, aging of the society. Very relevant also if you're looking at pensions and retirement. So I like showing this um, slide because, well, he's credited for being the oldest marathon runner. Um, in the history, uh, or since we've been looking at these things. Uh, ran his last marathon at 101 in Hong Kong. Um, what's actually even funnier is he started taking running seriously at the age of 89. So next time you're feeling lazy or thinking, you know, too old to start doing something, think of Mr. Singh, um, who actually started doing this uh, at the tender age of 89. But what's important about this megatrend is that it also shows you just how much society is going to be changing over the coming years as we age. And that has huge impacts. Impacts on the way society is structured, impacts on the way we invest, on the way we live. How are companies accounting for their pension schemes today? Life, average life expectancy of 65, 70, 80? The average life expectancy of a 40-year-old woman today is 100. It's 97, actually. So how does that impact the world we'll live in? How do we have to invest in a world like that? One of our very, very strong megatrends. At the same time, the average lifespan of a company listed in the S&P 500 has decreased from 67 years 
in the 1920s to 15 years today. Another megatrend, acceleration and complexity. The fact that as we grow older, the companies that we have to pick from and that we can invest in are actually getting younger and being disrupted faster. So as an investor, how do you navigate this? And we think actually it's by taking a long-term view. It's by being able to exploit the short-termism of other uh, market participants and by ensuring that we find themes that are driven by this secular growth, by the structural growth that we mentioned earlier. So when I talk about megatrends, and this is, this is quite important, um, we're not talking about temp um, temporary phenomena. So one of the perfect, one of the examples I have, I grew up in Southeast Asia, and in the 90s in Southeast Asia, um, and probably here as well, Tamagotchis were all the rage. So I don't know if you remember those. They, were, they actually managed to sell about 30 million of those. Um, so this were, those were really, you can compare it to maybe the Pokemon Go uh, of Nintendo uh, that we recently had. Um, I don't know how big it was in the UK, but in Switzerland and all of the parks, you have like hordes of teenagers kind of walking around, um, almost getting hit by cars, um, coming out, uh, playing on their phone. But essentially what we're looking for is not these things, although sometimes some of our strategies will benefit, typically with Nintendo, from some of these short-term crazes. But what we're looking at is really these trends that are going to invest, um, it, change the societies in which we invest and live over the long term, I'm talking 20 years down the line, 30 years down the line. They're not new megatrends. Um, and this is why, you know, we're always talking about disruption and we're always talking about how the world is shifting and changing faster and faster. But in fact, disruption is age old. And I love this image because you can see this is, I don't know if you can see it very well, but this is essentially New York City, Fifth Avenue in 1900. Horse-drawn carriages. Not a car in sight. 13 years later, the same street. Not a horse in sight. So the world changed there. Now, what is important is identifying how that change is going to impact um, our world and what investments typically will benefit from that. Do you put all in in the car? Or are you looking at all of the industries that are impacted by this change? And that's what we try to do. We try to have a very broad view and a very broad definition of a theme. So we do this um, by finding themes at the intersection of megatrends. These are the 14 megatrends that we use. We work together with an, um, an institute called the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. Um, but we also work with outside experts. We have each of our strategies has an advisory board dedicated with experts, um, scientific advisors, um, business leaders in the different themes, which help us keep this focus on the long-term view. So here you can see, typically, we have um, demographic development. So this is when I was talking about FOJA, um, aging, uh, demographics, how that impacts things. Urbanization, talked about smart cities earlier, uh, talked about um, glo the global city. This is also something that's extremely important going forward, et cetera. So I'd like to get you to think a little bit now. This is one of our themes that has a link to five megatrends. So these are really strong links. I'm gonna to try to get you to guess which one this is, if you can. So when we talk about demographic development with regards to this theme, we're really talking about aging of the population and the fact that productivity is going down and needs to be boosted in many countries. This theme will help, or is a theme that is highly impacted by that. Sustainability, the need to do more with less, to create more, to manufacture more with less and more efficiently. Knowledge society, when we talk about knowledge society, is essentially we're going from a world where we were mass producing, the same thing, the same t-shirt, massively, to a world of mass customization. You want your shoe that you've designed, that you've ordered. One day, it's a shoe. Okay, that's not very important. One day, medicine will be customized. We'll be able to have a pill that is exactly for you, for your particular illness, personalized medicine. 
mass customization. This theme is linked to that as well. Technology development. This theme is highly technological. So the fact that we've grown so much that we, we've managed to, um, we've had all these development in IT, in technology, in disruption, it's very much linked to this theme as well, as is economic growth. Any ideas? Tough one. A couple, couple months back, someone said hydrogen. Don't know how they got to that, but it's not hydrogen. <laughs> um, maybe let's, let's find out together. Robotics. You can see how all of those megatrends that I showed you are actually intimately linked to that theme. Um, the fact that we have a decreasing global workforce globally. And the reason China went back on its one-child policy is also because they have a very, very fast aging population and they are not finding enough people to work um, in many of the areas they were previously, fi they were previously finding them. Um, and and one, one such example uh, is Foxconn. So Foxconn has this one, millions robot, one Million Robots initiative. And when you look at it, you think, okay, well, it's probably because it's cheaper and, you know, prices in China, wages in China have gone up and maybe it's actually cheaper to automate. And actually, when you talk to Foxconn, they'll tell you one of the big challenges they have is finding workforce. Because the younger generation doesn't want to work in factory towns anymore. They don't want to do seasonal work. Um, they don't want to do work in factory towns. They want to be able to do other things. They're better educated. They want to work in the service industry. So they're actually having a huge challenge finding people. And with the one-child policy, this is actually not helping. So you can see that even in countries um, where uh, you would think that actually they have enough workforce, automation is going to be key um, to continue to boost productivity. And in our countries, of course, um, it's also allowing us to reshore entire industries that were previously sent uh, overseas. So robotics, very much an important area, especially when we look at the aging population. But when we're looking at creating a theme, we have several elements that we look at first, because there's a lot of great ideas out there, but not all great ideas can be investable. They, they don't all make themes, and they're not, not all themes are investable. And typically with robotics, we've been looking at it for many years but only decided to launch last year because not all of these elements were um, together. The first thing we look at is purity and liquidity. Is it pure enough? And one of the issues we had with robotics is not enough pure actors. Some large players had robotics divisions, had um, activities in this area, but they weren't very pure. It was maybe 5 10% of their bottom line. And so, of course, this is not what we're looking at. Another element that we really look at is liquidity. If you only have small players, you have a lot of volatility. So for our investors, this is not ideal. We want to have portfolios that offer perfect, you know, good risk return. And for that, we also need to be taking, uh, we need to take liquidity um, into account very seriously. Materiality. Materiality is essentially, are the mega trends linked to the top and bottom line of the company? Is a company within the robotics portfolio actually linked to a megatrend? So a good example of this would be intuitive surgical. 
So intuitive surgical is the it's one of the top positions in the in the fund currently, um, and it's the leader. Um, almost a monopoly actually for the time being, in robotics-assisted surgery. Robotics-assisted surgery, as you may or may not know, is actually a much less invasive way um, of, of being able to practice surgery, which is great when you're looking at an elderly population because one of the big issues is complications after surgery. When you're, more, when you're older, um, you tend to have a more complication so this is actually in very, very much linked to an aging population. <clears throat> Another thing that we really look at is low overlap. Is there a low overlap with traditional equity markets? And we look at the MSCI world. So is the overlap low with the MSCI world? This comes back to the fact that we're actually ben benchmark agnostic. We want to be actually looking at places that are... Um, we we want to be looking at stocks that are under-researched, under-penetrated, that you don't have the whole market going into. And finally, do these stocks offer an attractive risk return? So this is really the key to having uh, the key decision parameters for thematic investing. And when we look at purity, um, this is actually a research that shows that in fact, if you look at sector analysts and their calls over um, here, this is a period from 2009 to 2016, they tend to be right within their sectors. So this focus allows you to actually be a much better stock picker, which is what we've been saying for years uh, in terms of um, the focus, the thematic focus that we have. The other thing that we're actually very, um, that we, we believe in very strongly is this benchmark agnostic view. And here, this is an example of the MSCI World Index weights. If you look by sector and by geography. We're unconstrained, so that means that actually we could at any time have 50, 60 percent invested um, in one market and completely ignore another one because we don't think that the thematic opportunity there is, is strong. Um, and the same thing with sectors, right? All of our themes, if you take robotic, we have exposure to healthcare, intuitive surgical, surgical striker, we have exposure to materials, we have exposure to um, IT, um, and as well to um, to industrials, right? So you will find within a theme a broad selection of sectors. And this is what we were saying at the beginning, right? The fact that if you're a global equity manager, traditional global equity manager with a benchmark, you're going to have to stick to a certain degree to this. So you're sitting in New York managing a global fund and you have to have a certain exposure to Japanese financials. What do you do? You have your sector analyst, you'll go look at the list, you'll maybe talk to them, but do you really know that company? Do you really understand the drivers of this company, of this market? You know a little bit about everything. And so this is really something that we feel very strongly about with themes, that we have this focus and this capacity to go deeper. And so from a portfolio allocation perspective, if you look at thematic equities versus traditional equity allocation, you see that actually you're getting a much broader universe. In traditional allocation, what you'll tend to have is you will have probably quite an exposure to large, maybe some mid-cap, and you're going to go into, you're going to be predominantly in domestic, maybe going into developed, and emerging in frontier markets, you're going to have very little exposure to that which is understandable. It's a question of risk, right? It's a question of what your clients are asking you as well um, and, and managing the risk. With a, tradition, with a thematic allocation, you see that you actually cover much more of that, but that's because my water fund manager can invest in Rotoplas, the small family-owned water company that's predominantly active in Latin America because he can go there. He can meet management. He can do the research on that company because he's only focusing on water. And so this actually allows you to get a much, much broader allocation um, and a much broader universe um, than you would have with a traditional equity allocation. But it's actually a global equity uh, strategy. So here, 
for the sake of transparency, <laughs> and because it's important also to show you what we're trying to achieve, the individual risk return profiles versus MSCI world since inception of some of our strategies, of our, our strategies. So here's the MSCI world, um, and you have returns and volatility. The idea is to really be here, right? We're trying to deliver above average returns with limited volatility. Some of the, some of the um, strategies will, by, their, um, by, by definition, have more volatility. If you look at a biotech, which was actually our first product, which we launched in 95, so over 20 years ago, before it was ever really, before it was as popular as it was the past couple of years, um, biotech will have a much higher volatility profile. That being said, it also has a much higher return profile. So depending on what your clients are looking for, this could be also something that they can handle. It's all about their, their risk uh, view. But as you can see, most of the products are actually delivering above average returns, and a lot of them are delivering um, this with less volatility than what you'd find for the MSCI world. We have a couple uh, exceptions which confirm the rule. Um, Clean energy, which actually has its own dynamics, um, suffered tremendously from the solar uh, collapse a couple years ago. Um, but today is doing far better, much more focused on energy efficiency. And agriculture, which also was launched at the peak of the commodity boom, um, which didn't help. Um, but also a product that we've been looking at very closely and that we've strongly repositioned uh, over the past two, three years towards something that's much more linked to nutrition and wealth and, and health care. Uh, well-being, if you will. Um, so the whole kind of uh, healthy living, um, nutrition, uh, organics, etc. And that's the advantage of having a long-term view. Because it allows you to look at a theme and to see how a theme is evolving and to be able to change with how the secular trends are going over time. So in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is really focus on future leaders. We aim to solve global challenges, and we're really trying to find themes at the intersection of megatrends. And we really believe that as the world changes, even though for many of you and for many people, they didn't really know where to put thematics, maybe at some point, this is really a way of looking at global equity differently, especially in a world of low growth, where you have to find um, sources of growth um, and sources of secular growth. Um, so maybe investments should be changing as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Law. We have a, a couple of minutes for questions if anybody would like to ask a question. There's a microphone, sir, yes. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I've got a question about the uh, some of the slides that you show, and you said that the average life of a company changed from 67 to 15 years, for example, right? So, you know, in my opinion, active management doesn't work, right? I'm more like a passive management style yeah. kind of investor, let's say. So if you hear from an active manager that you have to have a long-term view, that you take a long-term view, bear in mind the fact you said that it changed from 16, six, uh, 67 years to 15, mm -hmm. and What's implied in that is that the, the average, the stages in the life cycle of the company change as well, right? So you go from the, sta from the seed to, to exit strategy in, in much shorter time frame, right? Mm -hmm. So if you hear from active management saying that you're taking a long-term view, don't you think that statement is a bit naive? To me? You think this is, this doesn't, you think that this causes myopia, the fact that we're but actually... Co contradiction, that's what I You mean. think there's a contradiction? Yeah. I think it's even more important to, to, to be able and to, to, put, to have a way of, of looking at investing in place which forces you to look at the secular trends. In a world where you are increasingly um, having things that are going faster and, as you said, um, could force some to have a myopic view. But that's why it's really important to have an underlying philosophy which is to look at these secular trends, right? And this is why we're always very mindful of these mega trends, right? The fact that we're, when we, we, we look at a company, um, we're in it for the long term. Some of the companies that we've held in um, water, for example, which we launched in 2000. So we launched Picte Water in 2000 at a time when 
no one wanted to manage a water product. It was almost impossible to find somebody that wanted to manage water in 2000. What do you think people wanted to manage in 2000? Tech. So finally, they found um, Hans Peter Portner, who's today the head of the franchise, and has 25 billion assets under management, probably did the right decision to go into water. But that was a long-term decision, which we could take because we're independent, we don't have shareholders, I think that makes a difference. So our partner said, water, good idea, let's try. That's how you take a long-term view, despite what's happening. This is how you reduce the noise. And actually, we think that the myopia that most, most um, investors have, a lot of investors have today, which is normal due to the market, due to everything that we talked about before, um, is actually a, an opportunity for us. Um, to be able to actually go in and find companies that we think are going to be there for, for a long time. And the focus allows us to really get to know also, to really go in depth, go on the ground. I mean, our timber manager <laughs> was in Australia in, I think it was like Darwin, out in the middle of nowhere last year, to go actually visit a company on the ground. I don't know how many changes he had to make. It was like a 30-hour flight. Um, and he, the reason he went out there is because he wasn't sure if he wanted to keep this particular company in the portfolio because there were a lot of signals from the market, from the short term, that were saying, yeah, maybe you don't want to stay. And he went out there and he met management and he went to see how they worked and he went to see the actual trees. Um, and, uh, and he came back and was convinced, and this is one of the better performance in, performers in the timber fund. But this focus allows you also to reduce the my myopia. Okay, one more question. Anyone? Come on. Gentleman here. How often, um, you kind of find Sorry. How often are you coming across new thematics, new themes for the... Uh, and you haven't got war in there yet, I notice. But <laughs> you have security. <laughs> We have security. Um, that's an excellent, that's a good question. So, uh, launched our first team in 95, uh, and then launched a couple um, from 95 into 2000 um, as well, and then we had the water fund. And I think we're most known for the biotech and, the, and probably the water, the water fund as well in 2000, and then have launched subsequent strategies. So we have 13 themes today. Um, robotics is the latest one, um, so it's probably, it, it depends. There's no, we don't say we have to launch a theme every, because, you know, robotics, for example, we'd been looking at for, we'd been looking at for many years, but again, we didn't want to launch to launch. So we launched when we knew that we had the right purity, we had the liquidity, we had the materiality, we had the proper risk return profile for our clients. So right now we have 13 strategies. Um, Robotics, robotics is the latest one. The uptake was uh, incredible. We have 1.6 billion in that product uh, today, and it was launched, so in dollars, and it was launched in October last year. And you saw the markets we had earlier this year, so despite, and, it's, and on top of that, this one is performing very, very well despite the markets that we've had. So, um, so I think, um, I think it, there's no rule, um, but it's something that we've, that we try to do, that we have every couple of years. Okay, I must draw it to a close there because we have another speaker in the wings. So please put your hands together for Mary Law. Thank you very much.